Pastor Ed Kropa here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey, with daily devotions for Friday, July the 1st, 2022. We continue our conversation this week um, in our overall theme of the will of God, uh, talking about God's ultimate will. God's intentional will is what God wanted for us and for the world. The world he created, according to Genesis, was very good. Um, but things broke down. Human beings exercising the gift of free will uh, abused it, disobeyed, rebelled against God, sinned. Um, and so then God had to respond to those circumstances and has responded to those circumstances in many different ways over the years, over and over, recounted in Scripture, um, but especially um, in sending Jesus into the world. And ultimately, when the world um, rejected him, put him to death on the cross, God intervened and turned that evil into good, just as Joseph talked to his brothers uh, centuries before about you meant evil against me, but God turned it into good. God turned the, the betrayal uh, and the arrest and the crucifixion and the death of Jesus um, into something good because the tomb was empty on the third day and Jesus um, rose victorious from the dead and offers the gift of new life. Uh, to all who believe in him. So we're going to talk more, uh, kind of wrap things up today and tomorrow. Um, I'm going to kind of reprise my uh, my sermon from last Sunday and kind of hit some of those points, maybe add a few other things along the way as well. Um, but uh, that's what we're going to do today. But we'll start first with the, the service of responsive prayer. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Show us your mercy, O God, and grant us your salvation. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Give peace in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Keep the nations under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and sustain me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. Lord, nothing you intend for us will ever be unsuccessful. Should great difficulty come upon us, we believe that your blessings will eventually come from the apparent ruins of our lives. When we look back on the hardships of life, we often marvel how unexpected good has come from such apparent setbacks and disappointments. Lord, remove any heaviness of heart that might weigh upon us today and deepen within us the assurance that ultimately all will be well because you are God. That prayer reminds us that nothing can thwart God's will. Um, and so that's what we've been talking about this week, God's ultimate will. And there was an illustration I used in my sermon on Sunday that, that kind of encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about here. Uh, it was a story about Major League Baseball. And if you're not a baseball fan, uh, I apologize. Please um, bear with me. But it was a story of uh, the, the Hall of Fame uh, Baltimore Oriole manager, Earl Weaver, who had a rule that, well, he had a lot of rules, like a lot of managers, but one of the rules was you never stole a base. Of course, stealing a base is if uh, 
you know, you, you get onto first base and then you you steal second, you run to second before they can throw you out. Maybe when the pitcher releases the ball, you take off for second, you get a good jump. Catcher tries to throw down to second base to get you out, but if you're a good base stealer, if you timed everything correctly, um, you stolen you've stolen the base. That's the term. Well, one of the star players back in that day, uh, playing for the Orioles at that point, was a fellow by the name of Reggie Jackson. Uh, he became known as Mr. October for his uh, exploits in the postseason when he played for the Yankees. He started out with Oakland. He played with a number of different teams. Uh, great player, great slugger, a uh, little bit on the, the arrogant side, had a little bit of an ego. And so he decided to, uh, to test his manager's rule, and he got on, got on first base, and he timed it, and you know he figured he knew, and so he took off. Uh, for second base, made it easily, and got up, brushed the, you know, the, the dirt off his uniform, and looked back at the dugout, and his manager was not at all pleased, uh, because he had messed up um, what the the manager had intended um, uh, to happen. See, behind Reggie Jackson was another good hitter, another long ball power hitter that could probably or possibly drive um, Jackson home. Well, now with him on second base, there's nobody on first base. And this feared hitter up at bat, they just intentionally walked him, threw four pitches outside the strike zone and walked him. Okay. So they took the bat out of his hands, as they say. The next batter comes up or is scheduled to come up, doesn't doesn't do very well against this particular pitcher. Weaver, way before his time, you know, used to keep track of that. Now they have the analytics and the computers, crunch all that stuff. You know, back then, I don't know what system he used, but he just knew that the next batter didn't fare very well against this particular pitcher. So he puts in a pinch hitter. Unfortunately, the pinch hitter doesn't come through. Um, the ending, inning ends without them scoring any runs. Uh, so that's Number one, a problem. The second thing is, is that the, the guy that he took, he pinch hit for, can't come back into the game, nor could the pinch hitter. Uh, well, I guess he could have stayed in the game, but maybe he was known more for his pinch hitting. So he was, he was um, um, now used, and he couldn't pinch hit later in the game if a, thing, uh, if a situation arose that required a pinch hitter. So it just kind of messed everything up, and Weaver let Jackson... <coughs> know that in, in no uncertain terms that he had had messed up what his plan was. And the same kind of thing, uh, according to Leslie Weatherhead, is what happens uh, with God. There's there's the bigger picture that God sees. See, Reggie Jackson, he just saw himself on first base. I can steal second base. He didn't get a, he didn't have a sense like his manager did of the big picture. Do we often do that? Yeah. We don't have a sense of the big picture. We often have blinders on, narrow tunnel vision. It's all about us, what we want, what we think we could do and achieve and so forth, and we lose sight of the bigger picture. And and that kind of throws uh, throws everything off. So again, to, to recap what we've been talking about here, um, Leslie Weatherhead in his book, The Will of God, thought that the will of God, it just, you know, we just throw that term around so easily or that phrase around. And he thought it really, there were really three things there. First, there was, as I said earlier, the intentional will of God or God's ideal plan for human beings. Secondly, there's the circumstantial will of God, said Weatherhead, that that's God's plan within, or maybe a better way of putting it is in response to certain circumstances. Um, in the illustration I just shared about the Reggie Jackson, Earl Weaver, the Oriole manager, well, Earl Weaver had to respond uh, to Jackson's unexpected steal of second base. And then third, what we've been talking about this week is God's uh, ultimate will. The ultimate will of God is the final, the full realization of God's gracious purposes. Now, in that baseball illustration, Earl Weaver didn't have control over the end of the game. Now, he might have made all the right moves and they pulled out the game, he might not have been able to make the right moves or the players just couldn't execute on the field. They might've lost the game for God, however, and, and Weatherhead is, is, you know, is, um, you know, really hammers this home, uh, for God, uh, the final outcome, uh, is never in doubt. And so earlier in the week, we taught, we saw that verse from, uh, Job where Job says to God, I know that you could do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
uh, Weatherhead quotes that verse. Um, so he wants to be clear that while God may have to uh, respond at various times that are brought, circumstances that are brought about by our free will and especially our human sinfulness, absolutely nothing in the end can interfere again with the full and final realization of God's purposes. And so he goes back to the cross um, and uh, as the supreme example of what he's talking about here, the intentional will of God, as we talked about, um, uh, was, was not that Jesus should be crucified, but that he should be followed. Uh, but the circumstantial will of God then um, was in response to the circumstances that human evil brought about um, and that sent Jesus to the cross. But the cross was not the end. I mean, they thought it was the end at that moment. We can say more about that, uh, I think, tomorrow. But um, it, God was able to work through that. God was able to turn that evil into good to bring about God's ultimate uh, will, which is reuniting uh, um, humanity with God um, and with and, and with each other. Not, not in spite of the cross, but using uh, the cross. So Weatherhead wrote, Christ did not just submit to this dread event of the crucifixion with resignation, he took hold of the, circum the situation. Uh, given those circumstances, it was also God's will that Jesus should not die like a trapped animal, but that he should uh, so react to evil positively, creatively, as to wrest good out of evil. The cross is not just a symbol of capital punishment similar to the hangman's rope, uh, but is a symbol of the triumphant use of evil in the cause of the holy purposes of God, end quote. Or, again, as I've been talking about, because it's probably my one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, J Joseph with his brothers, you plotted evil, you meant evil against me, but God turned it into good to preserve the lives of many. People, uh, evil was plotted and then perpetrated against Jesus. Um, if Weatherhead is correct, and I for one believe he is, that wasn't God's will. But never. But however, God had chose to, wanted to um, respond to those circumstances to turn that evil uh, into good. God turned the cross from a symbol of death into a symbol of life. And through the evil that was the cross, God was once again able to preserve the lives of many people who are alive today because of what happened. Again, you know, the... the what Joseph said to his brothers rings true all throughout throughout Scripture. Um, the picture in my in my mind, writes Weatherhead, is that of children playing beside a tiny stream that runs down a mountainside to join a uh, a river in the valley below. And and uh, as he says, little children can divert the stream and they can kind of dam it up and have great fun um, with you know with with dirt and stones and, and trying to make things happen, but not one of them is ever going to succeed in preventing uh, the water uh, from reaching the river. Um, I'm reminded here of the things that, that that I did as a kid. I did with my kids when they were young, going to the beach. You know, you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to, you're going to stop the waves or you're going to control the waves coming in. You're going to dig channels and, and, and so forth and have the water fill them and then try to, and, and try to, you know, dam it up and keep that, you know, like the little body of water there on the beach. But of course the waves keep changing and then more waves come and wash away everything that you did. I think that's the, the image that Weatherhead has here. We, we could try to c control things, um, but things in life are bigger than, than us. Uh, that water that trickles down from the mountain goes into the river and nothing's going to stop that. That wave that comes across the beach is going to wash away the big, beautiful sandcastles and walls that we create. Um, for a moment, for a few moments, we might feel victorious, um, but ultimately we don't have any control. And so um, Weatherhead says, in regard to God, we are like little children. Uh, though we may divert and hinder his purposes, I don't believe, he says, that we ever finally defeat them. And so when we say that God is omnipotent, we don't mean that, that nothing can happen uh, unless it's God's will or intention. We mean that nothing can happen which can finally defeat God's will or intention.
intention. Well, let's just stop there, and then we'll finish up tomorrow, kind of reprise again a little bit of uh, uh, my sermon from last Sunday as we wrap up this discussion this week of, of God's ultimate will. Have a great day today. We're starting a new month. It's the end of the week. A lot of good things about that, and uh, looking forward to uh, wrapping this conversation up with you uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Till then, take care and be well. Bye.